Hello, everyone. I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We have Father Justin with us. Uh, Father Justin, can you tell us where you are? My name is Father Justin. I'm the librarian here at St. Catherine's Monastery, which is located in the Sinai Desert. And can you give us a bit of history about the monastery itself? There's a lot of history here because the monastery traces its beginnings to the later third and early fourth century. It's the oldest continuously occupied monastery in Christendom. The earliest monks came here because this is an austere wilderness where they could devote their lives to prayer and fasting. But they also came here because this was a traditional place where God had revealed himself to the prophet Moses, first at the bush that burned without being consumed, and then at the peak of Sinai when he received the Ten Commandments and beheld the tabernacle in divine vision. So all of those inspired the first monks who came here, and the monastery has never been destroyed and never been abandoned in all of its history. We have 17 centuries, a continuous history here. And can you tell us about daily life at the monastery? The daily, the daily life revolves around the services. We do the complete canonical office, but we group the services together. At four o'clock in the morning, the stars are still bright in the desert sky. The bell summons the monks to the church, the church that was built at the command of the Emperor Justinian in the middle of the sixth century and has stood there ever since. We celebrate nocturnes, matins, and we celebrate the divine liturgy, the service lasts until about 7.30 in the morning. By then, the sun has arisen, the new day has started. We have the reading of the third hour and the sixth hour in the middle of the day. And at four in the afternoon, we read the ninth hour, we celebrate Vespers, and we read small compline. The complete canonical office is done in these three different periods. And that is what gives a structure to the entire day. And those services were done from the very beginning? Is that right? One of the oldest surviving Christian pilgrim accounts is written by Egeria, who went to Jerusalem in the year 383. We treasure every word that she has written because it is a glimpse to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as it was only some 50 years after it had been constructed at the command of the Emperor Constantine. She mentions that the first service it held in the night before the first light of day, another service is held at dawn, mid-morning, noon, mid-afternoon, and the final service at the going down to the sun and the lighting of the lamps. The daily cycle that she describes at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the fourth century is still the daily cycle that is in place here at Sinai. And can you please tell us a little bit about the relationship you have with the Bedouins? When the Emperor Justinian ordered the construction of the Great Basilica and the high surrounding walls in the middle of the sixth century, he also ordered 100 soldiers from Thrace and 100 soldiers from Alexandria to come to Sinai with their families to protect the monastery. The present Bedouin who live in the area trace their descent to those soldiers. They converted to Islam in the end of the seventh century but they have remained affiliated with the monastery. And that is quite exceptional and an important message for our own day to day. The monks are Christians, they are celibates. We have a Greek language, Greek culture. The Bedouin are Muslims, they are married. They speak in Arabic, they have an Arabic culture. We differ in language, we differ in faith, we differ in culture, and at the same time, we transcend these differences out of our shared veneration for Sinai and out of our shared veneration for all these centuries of collaboration. When you read the news today, you think, will there ever be peace in the Middle East? The differences seem so intractable. And then you see the peace that exists between the Sinai monastery and the local Bedouin, it becomes an example for our own day. Yes, peace is possible. And I think that is one of the important messages that Sinai has for the world today. Peace is possible. It is a sign of hope for our times. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned that you're the librarian. Can you tell us about the library? How old is it? What are some of the documents you're most drawn to? 
Egeria describes liturgical worship and a great number of monks living here in the area in the fourth century. That is an indirect reference to copies of the services, copies of the scriptures, copies of inspiring texts to support the monks and guide them in their dedication here. The library is the slow accumulation that has built up over the centuries for a number of reasons. The climate here is very dry and very stable. The monastery, as I mentioned, has never been abandoned and never been destroyed. And the monks have been very solicitous to produce manuscripts, to acquire manuscripts, and to have them here. So over the centuries, an extraordinary library has been built up. And scholars come here from all over the world with many different objectives to study the manuscripts and to benefit from them. Sinai has proved to be essential in the study of the history of the scriptures, in the history of the writings of the fathers, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. From the Georgian and Syriac manuscripts of Sinai, scholars have been able to reconstruct the Tipicon of Jerusalem as it was in the 10th century. The bindings here are also important. So the Sinai Library has proven to be of great importance for the study and the texts that have been preserved here in this remote monastery have a relevance and an importance for the whole world. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you have something called, is it the patent of Muhammad that he signed by the protection order? Is that right? We have a letter of protection that was dictated by the Prophet Muhammad, and it is a series of conditions. The first conditions concern the monastery. An example, if the monastery has a church, it's not to be confiscated and used for another purpose. The second set of conditions concern the Christians living in the area. If a Christian woman marries a Muslim husband, it must be with her consent and she is free to go to her Christian services. These are rules to ensure peaceful relations between the Christians living in the area and the new Muslim rulers. The letter that we have here was not the only letter. The Prophet Muhammad dictated quite a number of these, and they are now receiving a great deal of attention among Muslim scholars because they see these as important precedents for peaceful relations between Christians and Muslims. And you have a document linked to Napoleon Bonaparte, is that correct? The French ruled Egypt in the late 17, early 1800s. They're the ones that laid the foundations for the study of modern Egyptology. And because of these precedents that the rulers would always sign letters of protection for the monastery, he followed this tradition. So we have a three-page document. It has an engraving of République Française, and it is a series of conditions for the protection and the, of the prerogatives of the monastery. And he signed it Bonaparte, and it has the red seal on the third page. And do you have um, something called the, the Codex? I'm not going to pronounce it correctly. You have, you have like a Codex, an early New Testament. Is that correct? It is called the Codex Sinaiticus. Codex means a book as opposed to a scroll. And Sinaiticus is the Latin for of Sinai. This was the most important manuscript of the library. It was the entire Bible written within the lifetime of the Emperor Constantine, early fourth century. People have called it the world's oldest Bible because they felt that during the times of the persecutions, the Christians tended to have the Gospels, the Epistles of St. Paul, the Psalter as separate books. They were writing copies of the scriptures in hiding at the time of the persecution. When the Emperor Constantine ended the persecutions, for the first time, the Christians could have professional scribes using the best materials to write copies of the scriptures. And this manuscript is so regular that the parts that are not present today can be accurately predicted. 
The original manuscript would have had 700 leaves. It contained the entire scriptures from Genesis to the book of Revelation, as well as two early Christian documents called the Shepherd of Hermas, the Epistle of Barnabas, dating from the early fourth century. This manuscript is still essential study for anyone who's interested in the history of the scriptures, the New Testament, which was written in Greek, and the Old Testament in its Greek translation known as the Septuagint. We completed a collaboration with the British Library, the University of Leipzig, and the State Library in St. Petersburg, because all four institutions today hold leaves and fragments of this important manuscript. And as a result of our collaboration, the entire manuscript is available online at Codex Sinaiticus, and we published a quality facsimile for people who still want the experience of reading the original. This has allowed even beginning Greek students to find a familiar passage of the gospels. They can read it on the internet in the facsimile. They can feel that they are reading for themselves a manuscript that dates from the fourth century. Can you tell me please what the chapel of the holy bush is? The original church that was described by Egeria was present already here in the fourth century. Egeria writes, in the valley there is a garden, and in the garden there's a church next to the bush, and the bush is alive to this day and sends out green shoots. So the chapel that she described in the fourth century is built beside the burning bush. It was the chapel marking the place where the prophet Moses saw the bush being consumed with, saw the bush burning without being consumed and heard the voice of God and he spoke to Moses through the burning bush. The basilica that was added in the middle of the sixth century was added as an extension onto this first chapel and the first chapel survives is the easternmost chapel. It is a very sacred place. It is a small site. We have liturgy there on Saturday mornings if we do not have a group. And it is a very beautiful experience to celebrate the liturgy, to stand at the very place where God revealed himself in such an extraordinary way to the prophet Moses, to look through the window and see the burning bush growing even to this day. And you also have the well of Moses. Can you tell us a bit more about that? This whole area is an aquifer. The Sinai is granite. When it rains, the waters rush off, they form flash floods, and then the waters disappear. In a few places, they sink into areas, and that is where you have the oases. This has been an oasis from ancient times. We read in the book of Exodus how the prophet Moses fled into the desert. He met the seven daughters of Jethro, who had drawn water for their flocks, but then other shepherds came. Because they were girls, they pushed them away, and they took the water for themselves. Moses thought, that's not right, and even though he was all by himself in a foreign land, he pushed the shepherds away and gave the water back to the daughters. And they were home earlier than usual. And the father said, how is this? And they said, an Egyptian drove away the shepherds. Immediately, Jethro respected Moses. Here's a person all by himself in a strange country, but he's standing up for what's right. And so he said, where is this Egyptian? And that provided his introduction to Jethro. He ended up living with him. He married his daughter Zipporah, and he was here until the revelation of God to Moses at the burning bush. So the well that dates from ancient times and the place of the burning bush are here enclosed in the monastery. The monastery is here because it enshrines those two sites. Now you have a guest house. Can you tell us about that, and if someone wanted to come over there, what, what that process would be like? I think until the late 70s, anyone who came here either stayed inside the monastery or in a tent in the garden just outside the monastery. But it was in the early 80s that the modern roads were constructed here, and the number of visitors began to increase exponentially, and then accommodation had to be made for them. So it was at that time that the monastery created a guest house in half of what had been the garden, and then other hotels, restaurants, and shops were developed in the area. 
the monastery later updated its guest house. As a result, we have accommodations for 150 pilgrims short, in a short distance outside the monastery, and there are other accommodations in the area. So it is now comparatively easy to visit. Egeria took 22 days to come here from Jerusalem. So it still requires hours and a bus and a car to come here, but it is so easy compared to how it was even 100 years ago. And a great number of people do come here to see not only the monastery, but the whole area. And can you tell me a little bit about the Mount Sinai Foundation, what they do and how people can help? The Mount, the St. Catherine Foundation was founded in London in 1996, and then an affiliated foundation was created in New York in 1997, and later an affiliated foundation in Geneva. And they were chartered for the express purpose of the conservation of the life of the monastery with the library as its special focus and for the publication of materials relating to the treasures of the monastery and the significance of these treasures. So they have done a great work over the past 25 and more years. It was with their funding that we have renovated the library, which is now not only a more beautiful place, but a better place for the preservation of the monastery of the manuscripts with a very advanced fire protection system in place and greatly enhanced facilities to allow scholars to come here and study the manuscripts. Thank you so much uh, for talking with me, Father Justin. It was absolutely uh, amazing. There is so much to convey here. This is just an introduction, but we hope that these few words will inspire further investigations for this study, and ideally that people will come here to see things for themselves.